This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone. I'm Tanya. And I'm Talia. And we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hey, Tanya. How are you today? Today's a good day. Well, How are you? That's awesome. I yeah, am doing awesome. great. That's all great. Yeah, everything's fantastic. It's fantastic. I have a, another fine episode for all of us to oh, listen to sweet. today. <laughs> fine. So welcome back, everyone. Before I get into it, I would just like to remind everyone to hit the subscribe or follow button on your favorite app. And have you ever heard of John Sweeney? Mm. No. No? No. The answer is no. The answer is no. Okay. I, no. I've never heard of it. No. So here, I'm going to get into Sweeney Todd. It. Yeah, not Sweeney Todd. Okay. <laughs> John Patrick Sweeney was born in Kirkdale, which is a middle class district in Liverpool, England, on October 13, 1956, to his parents, Jack and Catherine. Although John's family was relatively poor, his childhood was pretty uneventful. He was an overall happy kid. Oh, good. Who was always smiling. He had curly red hair and deep blue eyes, a huge grin, and thick arched eyebrows. Hmm. Jack and Catherine raised their son Irish Catholic, and John was raised to have a strong work ethic and family values. He spent his time training as a carpenter, and he was a really smart kid, and his family was pretty decent. He spoke with a stutter, and he was oh, endlessly. Oh, that sucks. I know. He was made fun, like, incessantly about it. That would be hard. It. That'd be hard. Yeah. For five years, John found work throughout Europe. He worked for various construction sites, like, as he got older, in Spain, France, Holland, Italy, Germany, and Austria. And because he had a really good work ethic, he made pretty decent money. Like, he was really hardworking. And while he's traveling, you know, he's dating and meeting various women having a good time having he's a young. good time and he's young but at some point something in his brain snapped hmm. when he came back to england after working abroad for a few years he seemed to be just incredibly angry bitter and jealous jealous of what i don't know he just was angry all the time his life was just now consumed by taking hard drugs and drinking and with this came a thirst for intense violence okay Well, I mean, I mean, in college I did some things and there was some (laughs) drinking, but I did not have a thirst for intense violence. I know. I don't know what happened to him. His overall appearance changed. Also, he once like had a full head of neat curly red hair. He was thin. He just didn't take care of himself anymore. No, because he was an alcoholic at this point. His face is beat red. Yeah, he was just disheveled and his appearance just kind of was a mess. Even though he had a vicious temper, he still really wanted to settle down and start a family. So in 1976, he met a lovely woman named Anne Bramley, and he married her that Mm. same year. Mm, Great. Yeah, it was great. Not really, though. Anne was wonderful. She had a warm heart, kind smile, and she was raised with the same kind of family values that John had. They moved in together after they got married and lived near Liverpool, and they ended up having two kids, Michael and Tracy. The happy family that John envisioned for himself, it really never came to fruition because of his temperament and his alcoholism. Yeah, he's angry. He eventually got into committing like petty crimes, theft. But he was a hard worker. I don't understand. And it was partly because he was drunk. Oh. So he would commit petty crimes, assault, drug possession. Mm. And the marriage between John and Anne, it was turbulent. Well, yeah. And it really only lasted till 1979 when they divorced. At this point, John had become distant, and whenever he was around his family, he was violent. Hmm. And Anne wanted to keep the toddlers, Michael and Tracy, away from Dad. Yeah, and he's she, violent. Yeah, he's drunk. violent, and she would have to call the police hmm. due to some of the abuse yeah. that he did. Poor Anne. But she also had a soft spot because she's John, nice. Yeah, she's nice, and John is the father of her children. Okay. So she wanted to give him another chance. And he did apologize to Anne. You know how it is. It's a vicious cycle Cycle, of abusers, right? He promised, I'm going to leave the drugs and the drinking behind me. Not steal from people. Yeah, and he made Anne believe, you know, they had a bright future. 
She gave him the second chance and invited him back into the family, and they got remarried in 1981. So they did get divorced. Yes. And in her defense, when she met him, he was a hard like, right. worker. Right, and so she's morals. thinking, okay, maybe he just lost going his path, mm-hmm. lost his way. Yeah, and so they got back together, and she believed that, you know, he was changed, but... She actually remarried him? Yeah, and she remar- I mean, she remarried him. Wow. But he really didn't change. He was still... Surprise! Drinking. Yeah, surprise! He was still drinking, and he vowed that he wasn't going to ever let Anne leave him again. Their second marriage didn't last, by the way. Again, surprise. Again, surprise. It didn't even last a full year. At one point... This is really weird. John gave their child, Michael, a drawing that showed Anne, Michael's mom, dead and lying in a coffin. What? I know. Hey, son, I yeah. drew a photo I for you. I got a picture for you. I got a picture for you. Look at it. It's your mom. And next to the coffin was a gravestone that read, rest in peace, Anne. Michael mm. ran to his mom and handed her the drawing. And That's horrible. Anne was like, what the fuck? Yeah. You know, she's like, kind of like, this is just crazy. Like, he's... He's lost his mind. Clearly. She got really scared. Yeah, so clearly. She knew she needed to take Michael and Tracy out of the situation. And, and just get leave safe. Them. Yeah, get and safe. get safe. She ran away at midnight Good that night her. to her family's home in Northampton. But John always had a way of finding them. In November of 1982, Anne had taken her children to a small cottage in Ormskirk, which is a small town in West Lancashire. I'm saying it wrong. I know it. It is 14 miles north of Liverpool. And she thought she'd finally escaped her abusive husband, but to her extreme disappointment and fear, he had been following them the entire way, and he knew exactly where they were. He's stalking them. Oh, yeah. After following his family to what they thought was a safe haven, John watched his family leave for a quick outing. The memory of how many times Anne continuously rejected him made him really pissed. While Anne and the children were out, he broke the lock on the back door and crept inside the home. Mm, man. I know. He quietly walked throughout the house, and he knew that nobody was home, so, I mean, he was pretty comfortable. Once inside the home, he had a plan. He was going to hide inside Anne's closet. Ah, hiding in the closet. That's fucking terrifying, right? He didn't come to the home empty-handed. With him, he had a pickaxe in one (sighs) hand and a claw hammer. And the oh other. Oh my gosh. John thought, you know, I'm probably going to be waiting here for hours for Anne to come back, but he was wrong. It was only a little while before he heard movement throughout the house. As footsteps approached the bedroom door, John held on to these weapons tightly so he'd be ready when Anne was in striking distance. When John finally felt that it was time, he came pouncing out of the closet. But rather than seeing his soon-to-be ex-wife, Anne, John saw two huge police officers standing right in front of him. What? A shock John dropped both the weapons, and the stutter that he had suffered his entire life came out to play when he began making up excuse after excuse on why the fuck he could possibly be hiding in his soon-to-be ex-wife's closet, armed with some dangerous weapons. Pickaxe, hello. Hello. Anne and the children were spending the night at the neighbor's house, and while there, Anne heard the lock being broken and Uh, assumed that that an intruder was breaking into the house. So he thought they were out and about. He didn't know that she was just at the neighbor's house. Yeah, just at the neighbor's house. He's not paying. He's not a good stalker. No. And maybe, you know, yeah. Yeah, exactly. He's not a good stalker. He needs to pay better attention. (laughs) Doing a very poor job at stalking. John was arrested but wasn't charged. What? With attempted murder. Well, he should be charged charged, with something. Yeah, he wasn't charged with attempted manslaughter. Don't even say trespassing because I'll get angry. Well, no assault was committed and law enforcement felt that malicious intent was hard to prove. So authorities were at a loss as to what to actually do with him since technically he was inside his own home or so they said. It's not his own home. No, it's not. That's B&E. With an intent to cause, you know, Great bodily, bodily harm, harm. Right? Clearly. But John was just told to stay away from Anne. Oh, okay. Since oh. he had a long history of violence oh. against her, and Anne was able to obtain a restraining order. Well, that always words. is helpful. Yeah. So, that sarcasm and I know. <laughs> we know oh, that. We, we know that as lawyers. Mm-hmm. Restraining order is a piece of paper. Protect yourself. Right. 
the restraining order said he wasn't allowed to go near Anne or the children ever again. From now on, I'm going to refer to John as Sweeney since he no longer deserves to be on a first name basis with us. Oh, really? Okay. Wow, this is and bad. And I'm going to let you know why. He doesn't deserve it to begin with, but we need to distinguish between his life before he started killing and during and after. Okay. Okay. So, so he's turned into a Sweeney. Yeah, he's turned into Sweeney. The same year after the break-in, arrest happened, ha- slash non-arrest. Sweeney started over and moved to London, and this is where he ended up staying for decades. He only returned to his hometown in Liverpool to visit his mother. Throughout the years in London, John would have run-ins with Anne, but for the sake of their children, they remained civil. Or oh. at least he did, I don't know. Anne was probably scared as fuck, but... Yeah. Anne ended up passing away in 2001 after, sadly, an extremely long battle with cancer. Sweeney never made another attempt on Anne's life after that incident where he was arrested, non-arrested. He pretty much left her alone. That's good. Not long after his move to London, it was now time for him to seek another love interest. Hmm. In 2001, Sweeney would meet his first victim, a 33-year-old American model-slash-photographer Melissa Halstead. How's he getting a model? I don't know. His heart was still filled with nothing but jealousy and hatred, like before he married Anne. And unfortunately, this was going to be prevalent in what he did to his victims. Probably throughout his whole life. Yeah, probably. Melissa Halstead was born in Oakwood, Ohio, and was the middle child to parents Margaret and Jack. They were middle class, and both Margaret and Jack worked in the oral surgery field in Dayton, Ohio. Melissa was a very pretty girl, and her looks demanded attention. Although she was a little self-centered at times, she was very, very intelligent. She had close friends who said she was the type of friend that you would have for life. She was someone you could both kind of love and hate at the same time, partly because of her attitude, I think. Her incredible beauty and her bubbly and bright personality attracted all types of people, both good and bad. But even so, she was fearless. She had sparkling eyes. In a striking pose, and she was quickly scouted by the famous New York modeling agency, Ford Modeling Agency. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. So her modeling career took her across America, Asia, and Europe. Despite the various types of personalities around her throughout her career, Melissa always saw the best in people, but she wasn't that way with strangers. In 1986... She slowed her modeling career and trained as a fashion photographer and wait, makeup artist. Wait, we're in 86? I thought we were at 2001. At yeah, so time. this was before. Okay. She settled in London where she thought a new exciting chapter of her life was just about to begin. She had found a boyfriend and she told her family about him. His name was Scouse Joe. Hmm. She described her relationship with Joe as love-hate. She would experience the That's violence. Good. I know. That's great. <laughs> My daughter says I have a love-hate relationship. Oh, that's great. That's, that's wonderful. That's what you need for a marriage. And Joe was sometimes violent, and she would show up on set with black eyes. Oh, and, that's horrible. I know, and bloody lips. And if these hints about the black eyes and the bloody lip doesn't tip you off enough, Joe is really Sweeney. Right. He had a short fuse, and he never hesitated to punch beautiful Melissa in the face whenever he thought it was necessary to keep her in line. He was still this jealous, angry alcoholic with an intense drug problem. With Sweeney, the relationship between he and Melissa was just fucked up from the get-go. On three different occasions, Melissa tried to leave him, and each time she did, he would end up being arrested and charged with ABH, which is actual bodily harm. And it's a charge specifically found in England and Wales. It's like domestic violence, right? Yeah. It's when assault leads to the victim being hurt or injured. In September of 1987, Sweeney literally smashed Melissa's face (gasps) with a bar stool. What? And in December of 1987, he beat her so badly as she lay in the fetal position that he fractured both of her legs. Oh my gosh, she needs to, someone needs to get her out. Right, and the authorities were called on both of these occasions, but Sweeney served no prison time. He was only fined five pounds. Wow, but she went back with him. Yeah. He was heard saying at one point, who do you think you are? I'm the one who says what you can and can't do. Mm. In April of 1988, Sweeney threatened Melissa with a knife. This threat scared her so badly that she called her sister and told her, quote, if I go missing, it's John Sweeney who would have killed me. She's been with him a couple years now. Yeah. 
Melissa uh, got a restraining order from the courts, just as Anne had. Melissa's work permit to be in London expired in October of 1988, and luckily for Melissa, she was deported from the United Kingdom and was able to start a fresh life hundreds, thousands of miles away from Sweeney in Austria, Belgium, Germany, and France. Oh, good for her. She got out one way or the other. Yeah, but regardless of where she moved... Stop. Sweeney followed her. No. How's he getting all those pl- like those places? How does he get this money? I don't know. He was able to find her, and each time he did, Melissa strongly rejected him. His drinking just got worse and worse, too. Regardless of her straining order against him, the restraining order, yeah, order was only in valid yeah, as in the UK. So wherever she traveled to, she knew that he wasn't far behind. She did everything she could to cover her tracks. He stalked her abroad. He stalked her across six different countries wow. in Europe. Wow. On November 1st, 1988, Sweeney was able to find Melissa and track her to her new apartment in the Austrian city of Vienna. He was high and drunk at the time. He was obsessed with the notion that Melissa had cheated on him, even though they're They're not together. Yeah, they're not together. She's in a different country, buddy. Exactly. Exactly. And he refused to think that the end of their relationship was his fault. So he wasn't giving up. He broke into Melissa's apartment through the back door. She was home at the time. He Mm. gagged her and tied her up. And then he absolutely destroyed her apartment. He knew that if he looked hard enough, he was going to find proof that Melissa did, in fact, cheat on him. But during the many times that Melissa was assaulted during their time together, Melissa knew what pissed Sweeney off. So she was extremely careful not to upset him since she was scared shitless. Yeah. Oh, my God. I'm sure she tiptoed on, you know, eggshells. Oh, my God. I'd be like, I love you so much. I know. She never confronted him. She just tried to get him to relax and calm down. Melissa did everything she could to appease Sweeney, and eventually he did release her and because she knew how to get him to calm down. And right. when you're with an abuser, you get to know the signals. Eventually, she bought him a ticket to Amsterdam so he could smoke some weed, have a beer. And, and get the fuck out. Yeah, get the fuck out and calm down. And he took the ticket and he left. Even though he went to Amsterdam, he wasn't finished with Melissa. Rather than thinking that Melissa knew him well enough to know what he needed when he was upset. He took Melissa's act as some kind of scam to shut him up. Every woman in his life up to this point had done the same thing, or so he thought. I mean, he was paranoid. It fucked him up so badly that any time a kind woman did anything at all. He questioned it? Yeah, of course he questioned it. He thought it was a bribe or... Well, especially was... when you've gagged that woman and bound her. I, I mean, I would question I mean... <laughs> the kindness, too. I know, right? All the women in his life were supposedly conspiring against him, and he was going to make them pay one way or another. He had the mentality of, everyone's out to get me, and nobody could ever reason with him and tell him any differently. In this case with Melissa, Sweeney just knew that she was to blame for everything that had happened between them, and he wanted revenge. On November 4th, 1988, six years after his failed attempt on Anne's life, Sweeney approached Melissa's apartment again. The only difference between this time and the time before with Anne was that Melissa was home. He knew he couldn't break in, so he knocked on the front door. Melissa was pissed when she answered the door. I mean, he's it's like, what do you want? A cup of sugar? What yeah, the fuck are what, you doing do here, you buddy? Just you like, just you gagged me, bound me, and destroyed my apartment. Exactly. And just like the night with Anne, Sweeney had a claw hammer clenched in his hand, waiting with anticipation for his time to strike. Melissa, knowing that it was in her best interest not to upset him, led him up to the first floor of her apartment. I don't think she saw the claw claw hammer. hammer. When her back was facing him, Sweeney swung the hammer Mm. and made contact with her skull. (sighs) I know. Once she fell, Sweeney straddled her and proceeded to hit her a few more times with the hammer. She should have never let him in. No. Melissa somehow survived this attack, Oh! and she woke up in a hospital bed. Oh, that's happy. Thank God, right? Melissa said of the attack, quote, I only ever wanted to help him, but now I know he must have really hated me, end quote. Or he, yeah, he's a psycho. Yeah, or he's a psychopath, right? psycho. Hello? Sweeney was arrested later that day. The attack obviously left Melissa traumatized. Yeah. And disfigured. Hmm. When questioned about the attack, Sweeney told investigators that it wasn't premeditated. Okay, sure. Really? You just hit a hammer I, I in your just, pocket. I'm knocking on Tanya's door with my claw yeah. hammer. <laughs> just for the fuck of it, See right? See what's going on with you tonight. Yeah. 
but it was instead based truly on the emotions of two lovers in the heat of a passionate moment. Oh. Although Austrian authorities weren't able to charge Sweeney with what? either attempted murder or attempted manslaughter, I don't know, he was found guilty of an aggravated assault okay. and was sentenced to 12 months in prison. 12 months, okay. So and he's then, done like a five-pound yeah, fine, fine in 12 months. In 12 months. And he was to be deported for 10 years. Hmm. He was, of course, released early, and Melissa helped him achieve this early release. Melissa. Girl. She saw the good in him and Mm. fell for the tears, begging, and promises. He just loves her so much. I know, he's going to leave her alone. This time, I'm really, I promise, I'm going to leave you alone. Melissa spent two weeks in the hospital (gasps) due to her injuries. And she relied on painkillers to keep headaches from incapacitating her because she had a fractured skull. Mm. But she still helped him. On March 27, 1989, Sweeney was released after being in prison for six whole months. Oh. And just like Anne, Melissa gave him another chance. What? The two rekindled their relationship. Okay, well, I have rules. Claw hammer on my head. No. No second chance. No second chance. No second chance. And I would think this is more like the fifth chance or tenth chance after all the bullshit he's done. I don't blame the victim. No. She's trying. The two rekindled their relationship. A few months later, Melissa's body would be found in a duffel bag, Mm. floating in Mm. a canal. I can see that coming. Yeah. On the day that Sweeney was released, Melissa picked him up from prison with packed bags so that they could relocate to Holland since he was banned from Austria. You know, he got deported Mm -hmm. for the next 10 years. Melissa ended the restraining order she had so that the two could start their new lives together. Mm. Sweeney was a sick man, but Melissa truly believed that he loved her, even though he controlled every move she made. She just couldn't see it. While in Holland, Sweeney spent most of his days in Amsterdam, since drugs were legal there. He's just probably t- having the Smoking time of his some life. This was the worst spot for him to be. He was drinking, using drugs heavily. He experimented with LSD, and he became addicted to heroin. Oh. And although he got some odd jobs in carpentry, Melissa was the breadwinner okay. for the couple. She had gotten a job as a fashion photographer and makeup artist, and that's pretty much what paid their bills. Everybody probably has to be wondering what she's doing with this loser boyfriend. I know, right? I'm just I thinking. mean, the money that he made as a carpenter, that's what he used to pay for his drug and drinking habit. The physical abuse didn't end either. Melissa was not. continuously beaten by Sweeney. And whenever she was questioned about the bruises, she just covered them up with makeup and she would make up excuses. Thankfully, her job took her out of town for months at a time. But when she was gone for work, Sweeney just got worse with his paranoia, his drug use, and drinking. His jealousy was boiling over and his mood got dangerously dark. In April of 1990, Melissa came home from being away on business. And she was on her way home, and she had decided that she was going to leave Sweeney for good. But unfortunately, when she came home, that was the last anybody ever saw of her. On May 3rd that same year, an army duffel bag was seen partially submerged, floating down a famous canal in Rotterdam, about 50 miles from Amsterdam. Two police officers spotted the bag and just assumed it was lost or stolen luggage. When the two men lifted the bag out, and the water's draining out of the bag, but the bag just was really heavy, like dead weight. Once the duffel bag was unzipped, police discovered the naked torso. Torso? Of a female. Torso. Yeah, that had been sliced up, <gasps> folded in half, mm. and jammed into the bag. No. Oh, there that's... was no head, hands, or feet with oh, her body. Oh, my God. A carpenter saw was used to remove her head and feet. The tibia and fibula was sawn through? Her spine was completely severed, and her hands were cut off, like I said. Authorities believe that the bag was in the canal for about a week, and decomposition was in an advanced state. The police had no idea who this woman was. She had no ID. She was naked. Right, there's no hands. There's no feet. The killer did everything he could to cover his tracks. Almost all of the DNA evidence was washed away from the body, being in the canal for so long. The only thing the police had to go on was her torso. That's not much. No. And maybe there's a missing person report. Yeah, maybe. And I think one of the reasons why her head, for obvious reasons, identification, but Sweeney, if you remember, had fractured her skull, Mm. and that could have led them to hospital records. Right. Melissa Halstead was now marked as a Jane Doe 
and she was buried in an unmarked grave in a Rotterdam cemetery. Since Melissa was such a free spirit, her family had no idea she was even missing until November of 1990 when she failed to wish her mom a happy birthday. How long had she been dead by then? She had been gone for several months, like her body was found in May. So this is what, five, five, five six know. months later? I'm good at math. The Halstead family hired a local lawyer to investigate Melissa's disappearance, but it was obviously too late. She was gone, and Sweeney moved back to England, hoping to find another woman to love. This time, it was a woman by the name of Delia Balmer. And before I tell you more about Delia, we're going to take a break. Delia met Sweeney in 1981 inside of a pub in Camden, England. Unfortunately, Delia was smitten with Sweeney from wow. the moment she laid eyes on him. And I just don't get that because he's it. like a it, toad, it, okay? It doesn't seem attractive no. to me, but that's But fine. whatever, maybe. I don't know. Maybe it's extremely charming. Who fucking knows? Delia was a petite, shy blonde who worked as a nurse and had an irrational fear of any and all electronic devices. No. She was absolutely infatuated with Sweeney, and shortly after their relationship began, he moved into her apartment, which coincidentally was located about a mile from the canal, where more remains would eventually be found. Delia's apartment was a little odd. She had every electronic device inside of her home in cushions for fear that they would cause cancer. Did you ever see Better Call Saul? Yes. Or oh, his yeah, brother. his brother. You're right. Yes. Yeah, so it's like Chuck, right? Chuck, yes. yes. <laughs> had that, like, um, yeah. all of the clothing, everything to protect him yes, from that. Yes, from that. Yeah, so this is what Dahlia's like. Sweeney decided to redecorate her apartment with mm. various beer cans, crack oh, that's pipes, lovely. Horror, oh. yeah, horror magazines, and a pet tarantula. Oh. But they didn't stop there. To top it all off, he was a self-proclaimed artist and decorated her apartment with morbid depictions of headless female corpses. Why not? Axes, blood, torture, and various body parts. He's an artiste. He's an artiste. Just like Sweeney had with Melissa and Anne, Dahlia's life was strictly controlled. He mentally, emotionally, and physically abused Dahlia over a four-year span. I hate him. I know, and she would soon be. His next victim of Mm. unimaginable horror. In November of 1994, Delia attempted to leave Sweeney. She had been beaten and bloodied so bad that she was just terrified for her life. You do know that when the victim of domestic violence either A, becomes pregnant, or B, decides to actually leave, the risk of them being murdered really really increases oh that breaks my heart pregnancy and then leaving oh man that's terrible i used to work at a domestic violence shelter oh really Mm -hmm. it's so sad sweeney had ways of punishing dahlia Mm. he would tie her up to the frame of her own bed and he would use the same type of rope that he used to tie melissa's lifeless body up that's what he used the same type of stuff with dahlia this punishment would last for days, 48 hours, oh, days. Oh, my God. Torture. She, she was repeatedly raped, <sighs> tortured, beaten, and strangled while a gun was held to her head. If she screamed, she was told that her tongue was going to be cut out oh, with one of the kitchen knives. He used this time with Delia to brag about what happened to his last girlfriend. Oh, shit. I know. When she tried to leave him. He told her that Melissa was found in the Rotterdam Canal, decapitated with her hands and feet cut off. Surprisingly, Delia's life was spared, at least at that point. He left her beaten and bloodied while tied to her bed. When Delia was finally out of that situation, I think John left and maybe untied her. She somehow got got away. She confided in a friend about what had happened. Oh, I'd be calling the goddamn police. I know. And at this point, Sweeney fled to Germany. I get it. Exactly. She probably is afraid. PTSD. Right. She did go to the authorities after this, eventually. And since this wasn't the first or second offense for Sweeney, he was arrested a few days later and deported back to the UK. They found him. Hey, in, in here, why don't you just go back to the UK? Yeah, you just need to go back. We don't want you here. Delia said later, quote, he will do something. He will cut me to bits, just like he had Melissa, end quote. On December 22nd, 1994, Sweeney was released on bail from Pentonville Prison. 
This prison was walking distance from Delia's apartment. I thought he got deported. Well, he, that was in Germany. He had fled to Germany, and then they deported him back to the UK. Oh. Once word of his release reached Dahlia... Oh, she's terrified. Oh, yeah. She was scared for her life. She knew... She should be. He was coming for her. Absolutely. I get the fuck out of Dodge, Amen, man. right? So she's coming home, probably from work, and in this little quiet town where she lived. And she usually bicycled home, so she's off her bike. She's walking her bicycle up to her apartment building. Sweeney jumped out and began slashing and slicing her with a knife. Like, surprised Mm. her. She put her hands up in self-defense, screaming her head off, as obviously anyone would in this situation. Then she saw her own finger flying through the air. Oh, man. Dahlia said, quote, I saw my finger fly through the air, and I thought, that's it. I don't want to live anymore, end quote. Not only was her pinky finger on her left hand completely severed, but Dahlia also sustained multiple lacerations to her hands, face, chest, and legs. Both of her arms were broken, and she was stabbed in her thighs and breast. She had an axe wound to her head. Oh my goodness, an axe wound to the head. And a punctured lung. And she lived? And she lived. Wow. As she lay screaming in a pool of her own blood, neighbors heard the screams, and they all came running out, armed with various weapons, and they chased Sweeney down the street. Damn. This poor woman could have died, but she she was a badass, and she survived this attack. Dahlia passed out from losing so much blood and woke up in the hospital bed inside of the ICU of the Royal Free Hospital. Dahlia said that she died inside that day, and she was no longer the same person. Fucking A, she probably got that. PTSD, right? Yeah. She was physically and emotionally scarred forever. She's maimed. Yeah, absolutely, she was maimed too. Sweeney went on the run for six years after six this. Six years? Six goddamn years. Mm-hmm. When told by her friends to watch her back for Sweeney, Dahlia replied, quote, It's too late. I am not scared anymore because I am not me anymore. Mm. Oh, I don't even know what to think I of know. that. The police questioned Dahlia about what happened to her, and she told them everything about the rape, torture, and beatings. She told the police that Sweeney confessed to killing Melissa in Holland. The police went to search Dahlia's apartment, and they couldn't believe the artwork on the yeah. walls. They also discovered that Sweeney had left his murder kit inside of the apartment. Oh, he has a murder kit? Yeah, this kit was a similar green duffel bag that the remains of Melissa were found in. When Sweeney was on the run, he found an old friend, Kevin Pratt, who he stayed with for some time. He bragged about the attack on Dahlia. He Mm. confessed that he had killed and dismembered Melissa. He also lied to Kevin about there being a huge monetary reward for his capture. Sweeney did. Why? Why? I don't know, because you think that's when well, somebody like, would turn Tanya, you in. if I'm like, hey, I haven't seen you in a long time, guess what? Guess what? I had killed uh, Melissa, I almost killed Dahlia, yeah. and there's a huge reward and for me. And there's a huge reward like, for me. Whoa, I'm impressed. I know. Like, <laughs> I'm impressed. Ooh, right? I'd be yeah, like, what the yeah, fuck? Yeah, you know what? Maybe, Tanya, you need to find a hotel to yeah, stay in tonight. I don't tonight. know if I want you here at my place. I know, right? Sweeney did what he could to keep his head down, so he moved on from Kevin to his ex-wife, Anne, and her kids. <gasps> yeah. You told me they were done. Yeah. He never mm. attacked her again, no. but while staying the night with them, he smoked weed and got Wait, drunk. Wait, he stayed the night there? Yeah. He told Anne that he had done something so bad, and I think maybe because there were so many years, years in between, probably. Yeah. You know, she probably let her guard down, right. thinking, whatever. So in Anne's defense, maybe that's what happened. He told Anne that he had done something so bad that it would make her hair stand on end. He then confessed to murdering Melissa as well as two other women. Oh. I don't know. Yeah. He knew that law enforcement was searching high and low to locate him due to his attack on Melissa. So after leaving Anne, he hitched a ride back to Liverpool to visit his mom. While staying with her, he taunted the authorities by writing a letter to Scotland Yard and bragging about his many crimes. He wrote to them that they would never catch him. Narcissistic. Yeah, brazen. guess yeah, guess what he described his attack on Dahlia as? What? An accident. A X E. Accident. Yeah. Fucker, Fucker. Right? Sweeney had nobody else in his life at this point. He had run out of options, so he decided to flee the UK and he went further into Europe where he decided he's gonna spend this is how he's going to get away. Knowing that he had to remain under the radar, he continued to work as a carpenter, making money under the table, and went back to using the many aliases that he had come up with earlier in his life. Like when he was thieving, remember I told you he was doing these petty crimes when he was first with Anne. 
He lived with drug dealers to feed his LSD, weed, and heroin habits. And like I told you, for six years, he had fallen off the grid. He was gone. Finally, after six years, he resurfaced. He returned to England and went out in search of another lover. This time, it would be a 31-year-old mother named Paula Fields. Paula was the youngest of 11 children and was born into a typical working class family in one of the poorer regions of Liverpool. The end of the 1970s was really rough for the Fields family as the shipyards closed down causing poverty, like just mass poverty and unemployment. The underfunded council couldn't provide the area with basic necessities such as housing, heat, or even food. So thousands of families were homeless, but the struggles for Paula had only just begun. Paula's mother died when she was only nine, mm. and all of the Fields' children were split up to live with various relatives. Because so they, they were could, 11, you said, yeah, right? Yeah, oh, that's a lot You know, they went around to other kids. family members that's so that they could be cared kids. for. Yeah, it, oh, it's a shit ton of kids. Paula had no education, so she had trouble raising her own three children. I mean, she struggled financially. Right. You, I mean, right. I, I, I can't even imagine. In 1998, she made the move to London to try to start a new life for her and her own little family. As a single mom of all boys under the age of five, she Ooh. worked shifts at the local laundromat and was able to make enough money to get a single room at a nearby hotel and halfway house called Highbury Hotel. Since she was no longer making enough money to take care of her kids, though, Paula turned to sex work. She was desperate to earn money, trying to raise her children, but eventually she got addicted to crack. Her children were taken away from her and placed into foster care. In the fall of 2000, Paula met and fell in love with a red-headed carpenter named Scouse Joe. Scouse Joe? Yeah, which is... Joe. John. Yes, Wait, John's John. sweetie. Since Joe had access to drugs, she moved into his apartment, even though he still had his morbid artwork hanging up and he had no, his pet... you gotta let some things go. Right. <laughs> and he had this pet Reach tarantula and his duffel bag full of murder supplies. I can only imagine what was in there. Tools. Yeah, tools and rope and God knows what the fuck else. He's a carpenter. Ugh. Paula spent most of her time strung out, and she didn't even notice when Sweeney really took over her life like he had with the other women from his past. On December 15, 2000, Paula was last seen walking into Sweeney's apartment. The last sound that neighbors heard was loud swearing and screaming. I think it's probably an argument. It's believed that Paula found out her boyfriend's true identity. Sweeney moved out of the apartment and Paula was never seen or heard from again. A couple months later in February of 2001, two boys were fishing along Battle Bridge Basin when their fishing hooks caught something heavy. Oh no. I know. The boys reeled in their lines to find a heavy black duffel bag and it was just reeking. Sweeney seemed to have learned from his mistakes with the discovery of Melissa's body, so what he did to Paula was much different. Mm, this isn't going to be good. Oh, he dismembered Paula's body into 10 different pieces. He cut through her neck, ankles, knees, wrists, and elbows, wrapping each of them in their own separate bags. He weighed down the duffel bag with bricks so the pieces of Paula wouldn't make the bag float to the surface. He did this in his own bathtub oh. with the same saw he used on Melissa. He cleaned the tub out, burned all of Paula's belongings, and that's when he moved out of that apartment. As with Melissa, no DNA was found on Paula's body. It had all been washed away. No clothes, purse, ID. There was no hands or feet or head found in the bag to help authorities identify the remains. Paula's body was unclaimed just like Melissa's mm. had been, and it was buried in an unmarked grave. She was a Jane Doe. Yeah. Sweeney got away with yet another brutal murder. Unbelievable. After the remains of Paula were discovered, authorities kept hearing about Sweeney sightings in London. The police sent out his description as well as his aliases to the various constables. On March 23rd, 2001, there was a red-headed carpenter named Joe Johnson working at a job site in Shoe Lane, Holborn, London. He was cited and the police knew that he was a very dangerous man, so they didn't want to take any chances. Armed officers surrounded Sweeney at work and he was arrested. When he was arrested, he had a 7-inch knife in his waistband. Of course. And a 9mm pistol was found in his work locker. Oh. The police searched What do you have in your work locker? I know. <laughs> oh, shit. Probably some snacks no. and I some Advil. got a couple and... guns. <laughs> I know, right? Just in case. Just a knife on me and, you know, guns in my locker. You never know. 
The police searched his apartment, and they found everything that they needed. Oh, I bet. To put him away for good. They found two loaded shotguns, a machete, zip ties, a duffel bag that was filled with ropes, hammers, saws, and over 200 drawings and poems depicting murder, torture, rape, and dismemberment. Oh, my God. Fucking A, right? Fuck. On one of the paintings by Sweeney, he wrote a poem which read, quote, Poor old Melissa chopped her up in bits. Food to feed the fish. Amsterdam was the pits. End quote. So clever. Wow. He could have had a whole nother career. I know. (laughs) Fucker. Another drawing had a gravestone that read, Rip Melissa Halstead, born December 12th, 1956. End quote. Many of the drawings were of Anne and Dahlia being beheaded and tied up. Like those were the ones that lived, remember? For the attempted murder of Dahlia, Sweeney was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment. While in prison, he bragged to police about killing three ex-girlfriends who, coincidentally, had never been found alive. He also admitted to killing two German men who he had caught having sex with Melissa. None of these confessions could be proven, so Sweeney couldn't be arrested for them. On June 12, 2007, the remains of Melissa and Paula Fields were identified thanks to advances made in genetic technology. Dutch police were able to upload the DNA profiles of the unidentified females that had been found decapitated 18 years earlier. Wow, 18 years. Yeah. Scotland Yard also had the same type of unsolved murder. Yeah, it's Paula, a... was, Paula was killed in the UK, and so they had hers. And So the Scotland Yard and Dutch police joined forces, and they were able to match DNA to both Melissa and Paula. The teams were also able to connect the causes of death and identify the killer. Sweeney was arrested and found guilty of the two murders on April 4th, 2011. 2011. Wow. He was sentenced to life in prison, and I think he got a whole life, Kara, so his ass is not getting out. Dahlia Balmer has since retired from nursing and has released a book about her time with Sweeney called, quote, Living with a Serial Killer. No. The remains of both Paula and Melissa were sent to their families for a proper burial, Mm. except their heads, hands, and feet were never found. And that is my story about John Sweeney. I hate that fucker. What the hell? I hate him. I never heard of him. I didn't either. I know. I mean. Gross. Horrible. Horrible, horrible, horrible. And I believe he killed more people. Oh, I'm sure he did. I'm sure when he was bragging about those other murders, I'm sure they were true. Yeah. He he knew he wasn't going to get caught for them. Right. Gross. Anyway. Wow. Well, thank you, Talia, for listening. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank tuning you. in is probably an outdated. You're not tuning in. You're what just are you listening. Doing? You're playing. Playing, playing. playing your podcasts. Playing your podcasts. That's showing my age. Thanks for tuning in, y'all. Anyway. No, tuning in's still appropriate. Is it? Mm-hmm. But tuning in is like tuning in a radio station. Yeah, but, but it's, it works for today. Okay. We're going to have it work. We're gonna, it's, it's fine still. <laughs> Hello, I'm 100. <laughs> <laughs> She's not even close. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening. And if you haven't already, hit the subscribe slash follow, follow button. button on whatever app you're listening Me to. Too. <laughs> <laughs> you can find us on social media at Hardcore True, True Crime, Crime. <laughs> and Facebook and Instagram. Thank you. <laughs> and, and if you, you go, are... go to our website. Yes, go to our website, crimesandconsequences.com. Oh, my gosh, we should have been a group. We should have. We could harmonize. You can find out information there about joining Patreon. Yes, you which should. Which is you would get an additional episode every week, a full episode. Full episode. You could also go to your Apple Podcast app and subscribe there. Also get early releases of these episodes and no ads. And no ads. There's no ads. There's no ads. You don't have to listen to that shit. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody listens to ads anymore. Well, everybody skips them, right? Right. Right. I mean, I do when I, I listen do. to podcasts. I, mean, I listen to our ads. Of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, I think that's everything. I feel like it is good enough. It's good enough. It's good enough. So until our next episode. Don't kill each other. Bye. Bye.